Okay, good afternoon. I uh, just wanted to welcome all of you here to CSIS and congratulate you all for making it here on such a hot day. Uh, you should be commended for going out at all. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw, and on behalf of uh, the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, um, but also the uh, Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis uh, at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, we would like to invite you uh, or welcome you here to today's event on the geopolitics of clean energy. Uh, for those of you who know CSIS's energy program, uh, geopolitics of energy is sort of our bread and butter. Um, for the last 10 years or so, we've been putting out reports on the geopolitics of energy as it relates to oil and gas markets, uh, nuclear energy, uh, regional issues dealing with geopolitics, uh, but then also uh, specific country studies. And today's event is actually about six months or so in the making. Uh, it was about six months ago we'd recently put out our latest geopolitics of energy overview, which is essentially looking out to 2030 and seeing what big new uh, uh, trends are on the energy horizon. Uh, and our good friend and uh, 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 senior associate, uh, Doug Arendt, who's also the director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis, came to us and said, you know, it would be really interesting is if you guys did something on the geopolitics of clean energy. We said, oh, that's a great idea, first and foremost, because I challenge any one of you to give me a, a definitive definition on what clean energy actually is. Um, but it is a, a term that's thrown around not only here in Washington, but increasingly around the world, uh, and has uh, more and more sort of geopolitical dimensions attached to it. Uh, I would say if you look just sort of at the renewable energy side of the clean energy uh, uh, space, for a long time, people have been interested in you know, technology breakthroughs, whether or not renewable energy could or would scale up to something significant, um, and how it competes with the conventional energy system. Um, but increasingly, clean energy, depending on how you define it, um, is, has its own sort of geopolitical dimensions. Um, things dealing with competitiveness, actual money involved, um, and a lot of reasons why the ge geopolitical intrigue about clean energy uh, is certainly increasing uh, uh, over the last several years. And so today's event is actually sort of a kickoff for a research series that we're doing here uh, at CSIS in partnership with the Joint Institute uh, on the geopolitics of clean energy. And we could not be happier to have uh, the group of panelists we've got here today to sort of lay the groundwork for what we're talking about when we talk about the geopolitics of clean energy and look at the dimensions that we seek to explore over the coming months. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to foster a discussion between uh, three of uh, the best experts we could find on the issue. Um, starting with Michael Liebrich, who is uh, the CEO of Bloomberg New Energy Finance, um, which for my money is sort of the preeminent institution following clean energy trends, um, both in terms of policy but also market development. Uh, he's going to lay the groundwork for us uh, on what's going on in uh, clean energy around the world, what we should be watching, uh, and how we should be thinking about the clean energy trends that we're seeing. And next we've got Claude Mandil, who was the ex uh, executive director. Nice was the executive director, <laughs> I know, right? You wouldn't be so relaxed, right? Uh, of the International Energy Agency from 2003 to 2007, uh, and who's going to talk about what we're terming the old geopolitics of clean energy. Now, what does that mean? Um, there's sort of two dimensions that we wanted to explore within this space. The first is how clean energy competes with the conventional energy system. Uh, and uh, so uh, Claude is going to give us some of his thoughts uh, on that. And then last uh, but not least, of course, is Doug Arendt, uh, the executive director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis, and again, a senior associate here at the CSIS Energy Program, who's going to talk through some of the dimensions uh, and theorize a little bit uh, on the, uh, the new geopolitics of clean energy. So without further ado, um, I'll ask uh, for each of our presenters uh, to uh, uh, either present their PowerPoint or give their comments, and then we'll foster a discussion and then open up for questions uh, from all of you. So Michael, please. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much, first of all, uh, and thank you, of course, to Sarah and to the team that helped put this together. Uh, my name is Michael Liebreich, uh, Chief Executive of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, just by way of perspective, uh, we have a team of about 180 people 
uh, that look at all the different sectors of clean energy. So we have a team on solar, a team on wind, a team on bioenergy, energy efficiency, and so on. And we collect, uh, as you'd expect from Bloomberg, lots and lots of data. So what I thought I could do today is go through a few different things, but start by looking at investment activity. It's a sort of untraditional way to start with clean, clean energy. Most things, well, energy, everything starts with sort of gigawatts and, and uh, barrels and liters and so on. Um, but what I'll do is I'll start off with the flows of money. Um, and so you can get some idea of the scale of what's going on in clean energy. Then talk about one of the main reasons why it happens, which is the policy environment, and some of the economics, the cost trends. Um, then put that into context, perhaps talk a little bit about the alternatives, not too much because we have greater experts here on the panel, uh, and then set up perhaps um, that discussion about the geopolitics uh, and what that means. So in terms of the investment activity, we track all the different transactions, whether it's venture capital, whether it's private equity, whether it's public markets, asset finance, uh, but also governments uh, investing in R&D, the sort of uh, work that Doug does during his, his, his day job, in a sense. Um, and uh, these figures then represent that grand total. Uh, so it's anything that, any money that is spent on, and our definition here for the purpose of this is renewable energy plus energy efficiency, the smart grid, carbon capture and storage. Um, here, it doesn't include natural gas or nuclear. Not that we've got anything against them, but you know, <laughs> the, the answer to your question is how to define it is, is, is just be flexible for whatever, <laughs> whatever purpose. So this is our definition. And you can see this very rapid ramp up in investment activity. Uh, back in 2004, when I started this, and we started collecting figures, 50 billion, and it grew to 186 billion uh, by 2009. And then there was this rather surprising jump. Uh, and remember, we're in the wake of the financial crisis, and this is a very cash-hungry business. And so that jump actually wrong-footed quite a few people uh, who thought that it was going to be flat uh, pretty much because of the crisis. And we'll look at some of the reasons why that happened. To put it in perspective, now, this is investment that you can see here in the generating capacity only. Okay, So this is just power generating capacity. And what you can see very clearly at the top, fossil fuel and their clean energy, um, really closing very quickly on the fossil fuel piece. And this is why I don't like it. You can, whether we have a problem with the definition, at least we're not calling it alternative energy, uh, when it's actually about to absorb more capital than fossil fuel generating capacity. So there you've got gas and coal on top. And down at the bottom, you've got wind and solar and uh, biomass and geothermal and hydro and so on. And so what we're talking about is nothing, there's nothing marginal and there's nothing uh, alternative about this. Um, and, and one of the themes that I'm going to try and develop in the time allotted is just how substantial this transition is, just how fundamental the changes are that are going on. Why that jump? Why did the, the investment recover uh, after the crisis so rapidly? One of the reasons is the stimulus spending. You remember the green stimulus packages? If you relate the piece of the green stimulus package that was, you know, you map it onto the definition of clean energy that we're using, then you get to a total of about $190 billion that was unleashed in 2008 in response to the financial crisis. $190 billion, and you've got to remember that you're comparing it to a sector that was absorbing about $180 billion per year of investment. So you have $180 billion, then you have a crisis, then you have stimulus funding of $190 billion, but of course it's not spent all at once. So where are we? Halfway through spending it, we've had three years, 2008, nothing was invested, 2009 it started, and 2010 you have things like the grant program here, the European Investment Bank spending lots of money, BNDES in Brazil, uh, and so on. And we're about halfway through, and the amounts that are being spent are about $70 billion per year. So the arrival of this money is clearly one of the reasons why we saw uh, that increase. The other reason, or if you're like cutting it a different way, uh, it's, not a, it's not separate, but it's a different cut of the reason for that growth, is look at these two uh, extraordinary growth stories. European rooftop solar growing from 20 billion to 46 billion of investment in one year. And remember, this is in a context where prices are dropping. And then China, 40 billion growing to 50 billion. So substantial numbers uh, and very rapid and impressive growth there. And so those are two of the growth stories within 
the clean energy space. So that should give you some idea of where the money is coming from, where the money is going, and the scale of it. And of course, one of the drivers behind that is policy, not just the stimulus packages, but a much broader set of policies, a much broader web of policies around the world. And it's very kind of confusing, because at the moment, you would think that, well, um, Copenhagen and Cancun has sort of run into the sands somewhat, and then over here, uh, there hasn't been a climate and policy bill. You can see those, these sort of negatives on the policy balance sheet, and it all looks like it's quite a sort of sticky and difficult environment. Um, there's, uh, you know, the US midterms, the shift in the political uh, environment here, probably leading amongst the, the, the more difficult trends in the space. Uh, retrospective changes or retroactive changes to tariff regimes in Czech Republic and in Spain, enormously uh, disruptive in Europe, and then tariff reductions, so clean energy just, just doesn't make as much money for its investors in other European countries. So in some ways, this year, a difficult environment, but in other ways, um, some positive uh, uh, developments as well. So Brazil, you've got some big wind tenders, tariffs remaining in Italy, uh, Cancun actually managed to do something rather than nothing, uh, and then a few other um, uh, positive moves this year. But you get this picture of a very confused policy environment, so where does that leave us? Um, the answer is in, in pretty good shape. Um, if you look at, these are some indicators from an organization called REN21, which kind of t takes the temperature of the clean energy space, you'll see that whether it's um, Renew renewables overall, excluding wind, the installations grew 26% compound between, this is 2008 to 2010, and you can see solar growing at 70%, solar manufacturing growing at 87%, uh, and then the, the reason for this sort of continued momentum, despite the fact that there aren't, um, th that it's a pretty messy policy picture, is that actually there's a sort of web of policies that's already been put in place over a period of time. So you can see uh, 89 countries with, policy, with renewable targets, 81 with feed-in tariffs, 52 with po uh, portfolio standards, and these are, I think, countries and regions. And sort of viewing it graphically, there's been this 10-year period of the policy being put in place to support either renewable energy energy efficiency or climate related initiatives. And so even though now there, aren't, there isn't this swell of new policy and new bills and new this and new that, this stuff is actually cumulative and that has left us in a place where the policy, uh, you, know, you won't get people in the industry to agree that everything's fine and rosy, but actually you have a pretty functional set of policies domestically in most of the large economies, most of the large states and so on. So there is activity pretty much um, around the world. A total of 1,741 policies. But the most significant reason, um, certainly I think up till now, but going forwards clearly is going to take over from policy as why this sector is going to continue to grow and why I think it's justifiable to think of it as a real transformation is these sort of long-term cost trends. So this is the experience curve for solar. And you can see that's crystalline and that's thin film, so two different technologies. Most of what we see is crystalline. And you can see 1976 to 2010, the experience curve really works. Um, and you know, th there's every reason to believe that it's going to continue to work out into the future. Uh, interesting, you can see the impact of policy even on this chart, because in 2003, the Germans brought in their renewable energy feed-in tariff which uh, enormously increased the uh, incentives for doing solar in Germany. And what happened is the volume of build went up. It was very difficult to get hold of silicon. And so the prices, you can see from 2003, go sideways instead of going down. And then, of course, um, you get more production volume being brought online at the same time as a financial crisis. And between 2008 and now, the prices have more than halved. So this sort of cost picture is incredibly important. A lot of the assumptions that we make as policymakers or as investors, you know, the, the specialists are aware of this sort of cost performance. The non-specialist think, still thinks solar is you know, 10 times as expensive as anything else and is really only viable uh, if it's heavily subsidized. This is what the future looks like. Over the next 10 years, we'll see another halving from $3 a watt 
to 145, and this I think is an example in, in Germany of a large project. So we're going to see that experience curve continue and the costs come down. Where does that leave you in terms of competitiveness? Um, here you've got uh, the sunniness on the horizontal axis and the uh, cost you know, uh, up on the vertical axis. And at the current cost of the equipment, what it means is if it's really, really sunny, you can produce solar power at 22, 23 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. And that's a residential, that's a rooftop system. But look at the electricity prices in a few markets. Here you've got Hawaii, Italy, Turkey, not the biggest markets in the world, but not, uh, not, not trivial either. And they are already competitive. This is with no subsidy. This is saying that right now, a solar panel on your roof will be cheaper than connecting to the grid and buying this very expensive electricity in those three markets. Go forward to 2015. The experience curve drives, as we've seen, the costs down. And now these are the markets that make sense, where you just put photovoltaics on the roof if you want electricity during the day, which you might for air conditioning, maybe for an electric vehicle. And then as it goes forwards, you can see some other markets. I should probably disaggregate the US into separate bubbles for different states. Uh, you can see California sort of becomes competitive before 2015. Other parts of the US, it'll be later. So what you can see, and this is not subsidized. This is, a, this is the price, this is the cost of electricity generated without subsidy. Uh, wind turbines, wind power is more complicated. There we saw this big surge, partly because of commodity prices and partly because uh, Chinese wind turbines are not being exported to the major markets like the US and Europe in large numbers. Um, we haven't seen the prices come down at quite the same rate. But we have seen wind turbines become much more effective, more efficient at extracting energy. What does that mean? That means most people think that coal is about 3 cents per kilowatt hour and wind is about 12. That's their assumption. That's their setting. That's what they're brought up to believe. The truth is this. The best wind farm, 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and new coal, not an old coal plant that's already depreciated, but a new coal plant where you have to pay your interest and a new coal plant where you have to put in proper pollution controls about the same price. Okay, now this is a bit fake. This is the best wind farm against a new coal plant. But what we're seeing is clean energy starting to compete without subsidies. And those islands of competitiveness will only grow. That's the size of wind farms. If you don't think the wind's going to get cheaper, that's the average size of a commissioned wind farm, 360 uh, megawatts. And they're going to have these, uh, particularly in, in China, the wind gigabases, the offshore wind, very large wind farms that are being built. Uh, and, and we're going to see that uh, grow. So wind is going to continue to become cheaper. Energy efficiency, we, already, we all know the McKinsey work that said that energy efficiency pays for itself. This is a chart of, um, of reductions in emissions, read reductions in use of energy by US companies in different sectors from the point at which they joined uh, this program. The, the EPA environment, climate leaders, so they were designated. And you can see that four years, you can see a 13% drop in energy use despite 16% revenue growth. These companies made money by saving energy. So energy efficiency is part of clean energy. And not only is it competitive, it actually is the gift that keeps on giving, as we all know. Vehicles. You know, we're in a very, very interesting time because we're seeing now the first series production mainstream manufacturer electric vehicles coming to market. The Chevy Volt, the Nissan Leaf, the Mitsubishi uh, IEV, I think it is, uh, and all of the manufacturers have got models. And at the moment, the numbers are trivial. They're tiny. It's, it's 1,000, 2,000. They're hoping to sell 10,000 or 20,000 in the next couple of years. Um, and one of the reasons is uh, that it, the batteries are very expensive. This is our forecast for the production of, of lithium-ion battery packs. And you can see tiny numbers over on the left, just trivial, you know, absolutely nothing. And then it ramps up, and this is driven by subsidies and support to 2014 over there on the left. And then it goes flat because those subsidies start to get phased out. They're grandfathered out. But then a really interesting thing happens. This is the cost of a battery pack. Okay? And when the cost comes down to around $200 per kilowatt hour, 
suddenly the ticker on your car, the, t the ticket price on your car is cheaper than the ticket price of a gasoline vehicle. Right? So suddenly that barrier of, oh my goodness, the batteries are really expensive, goes away. It's not just the total ownership cost, the sort of thing that only accountants will work out and buy a car uh, driven by total ownership cost. The actual windscreen sticker will start to, to be cheaper for an electric vehicle. And then we see the volumes uh, taking off like that. And again, it's driven by the experience curve. So the model, the way to think about this sector, if you think about, uh, we haven't yet linked it too closely to the uh, to, to fossil fuels and the old uh, energy. But the way to think about this is uh, it's like mobile telephony. You know, when it first came along, the, the premium between a mobile phone call up here and a fixed line fo phone call was absolutely enormous. $45, uh, uh, $45 per minute back in 1993. This is when only um, investment bankers you know, carried the big bricks. Um, and then it comes down to one or two cents premium. In fact, I don't even know if there's a premium anymore at all. And so I don't have a landline. I don't make any decisions, not because I want to be mobile or this. Other. I just don't want a landline. It's confusing and complicated. And that's where we're going to go with clean energy. <laughs> it's just going to be easier uh, and, and fully integrated into the energy system. And there'll be no cost premium. So that's my, sort of, um, my, my, my thesis on clean energy. Um, I don't want to spend too long on the alternatives. We all know what's, how we started 12, uh, almost exactly, I think it's just over 12 months ago, the year started with that. Then we saw some of that. Uh, then we saw some of that. Uh, and, and this is sort of, you know, so I'm going to postulate that the costs of the alternatives are not only um, higher once all of this is costed in, but they're also much more unpredictable. Uh, and that actually also has a cost in terms of volatility. Just to put Japan in perspective, just for a second, this is Japan's plan to shift to clean energy before Fukushima. Okay? You can see LNG going down slightly, coal pretty much flat, hydro growing, but some of the coal probably going clean, hydro, petroleum, and then new energy, which is all of the renewables and so on. And look at the one that they were relying on to go clean. We have two extraordinary uh, developments uh, as a result of Fukushima. One is that Japan, uh, Prime Minister Kana said, not only have some of these uh, existing power stations already been shut down, but the entire build program is, has been scrapped. Maybe some of it will be brought back in, but at the moment it's scrapped. So Japan is absolutely back to the drawing board how it can first meet its energy needs, then meet its future energy needs, whilst going low carbon without nuclear. The other extraordinary thing is Germany, which in response to an earthquake the other side of the world, has decided to shut down 23% of its electricity generating capacity in 11 years' time. Right, what that means uh, is, is at this point, I don't want to say it's anybody's guess because we all have theories and we're all, we're all, it was on the radio yesterday theorizing about it, but uh, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps Claude will explain the magnitude of that challenge and, uh, and what he thinks they're going to do. Um, and now this is, uh, this is a, a, another chart. If you look, you know, let's start with Japan here. Japan is the purple line. If you think that Japan's response will be, oh, well, we'll obviously just go to natural gas, right? We've all heard about natural gas, shale gas, lots of it, very cheap. This is the, um, the spending of Japan on oil and gas, 3% of GDP in a $120 oil scenario. And this is the numbers before Fukushima, right? And if you look at... India, we're talking about 5% of their GDP is going to be spent on oil and gas imports. Right? For the US, it's 2% and it declines for various reasons related to, um, presumably that's to, related to shale gas coming in, into UK um, supply. Now, the issue here is what you've got is this huge flow of money from the most productive economies in the world to suppliers of oil and gas. And that is, if you look at higher oil price scenarios, only going to get worse. And if you try and take nuclear out of it and go to gas, it's only going to get worse. And these levels of flows, it's hard to see India uh, achieve its development goals whilst shipping 5% of, uh, of its GDP overseas. 
It's just very hard to see. So look at, look at it from the point of view of what are India's incentives to move to clean and do, or domestic energy, never mind clean, domestic energy to stop having to do this. Um, and then the final chart on the alternatives. These are patents, just in case you think this is, um, is in some way going to, you know, the, the innovation in, in, in fossil or in, alter in the alternatives to clean energy is going to somehow catch up. This is um, pa international patent patents. So these are patents licensed worldwide. That's all technology. Here's clean energy technology. You can see the abdication of responsibility during the 80s uh, as, as research funding was cut for clean energy. But then it comes surging back. And this is fossil and nuclear energy. So the world's scientists are not riding to the rescue of fossil fuels on a white, on a white charger. Uh, they're actually piling their efforts into clean energy technology. So I, don't th I think the alternatives there uh, are not going to be um, making the same sort of rapid economic progress as clean energy. So this is my thesis is that we are seeing a fundamental uh, restructuring of the energy ind industry. It's, it's being restructured around uh, low carbon technologies, low carbon solutions, low carbon services, low carbon architectures. Um, it's, and I, I, I've used this chart, I think you may have seen it, it five years ago, six years ago when I started New Energy Finance, this was the thesis. This is going to cost trillions and it's going to take decades and it's a good place to do an information based startup therefore. Um, <laughs> it will be heavily policy driven. This is not just suddenly going to happen, uh, it's going to need nurturing and policy interventions. But it is inevitable given the economics, those cost curves. Uh, and the, the, incre the depletion and the, the increasing costs of the alternatives. It'll be funded by the capital markets because it's simply too expensive for governments uh, to fund themselves. And I like putting this one, it will be risky to bet against because it is so inevitable that when you hear how risky it is to invest in clean energy, I always say, well, hang on a second. You know, to me, it looks, uh, it looks like the, the, the safer of the two uh, alternatives. So what I want to do is just... Um, if I've got another couple of minutes, go through some of the sort of geopolitical, some of the regional uh, issues that it raises. If you believe this inevitable and complete shift, what does that mean? Um, so first of all, this was um, some work. Obviously, we, we pull these numbers anyway as part of uh, what we do at Bloomberg. But we published this very nice report with the Pew, which looked at how countries are doing, where is investment, uh, uh, and we, we compared in different asset classes and different time periods. And you know, China, 47.3 billion of asset finance was more than twice the total for the US in 2010. And by the way, it had come from, in two, if you go back to 2005, I, I don't even know if it would have been in the top, uh, in, in the top 10 um, countries. Um, and it's not just China. This is uh, announcements of clean energy investments, um, country by country. And at the top there, you can see Korea. Korea's green growth initiative, they've committed two, I think it's two or two and a half percent of GDP um, to clean, to getting the country onto a clean uh, growth route. And so you can see these big Korean uh, corporates, the big chai bol, making announcements and in fact making real investments in their clean energy businesses. Um, so it's really not just uh, Korea, not just ch uh, China, in fact it's not even just uh, China and Korea, you'll also see it in Taiwan and across Asia. This is a very nice way of showing what that means in a very concrete way. What you've got in this triangle, this is um, wind generating capacity, okay? And these are net additions. So this is how much wind is being built year by year. And down in the right, you've got the Americas, north and south. And over in the bottom left, you've got Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And up there, you've got Asia and Oceania. And this is, back here, it's 1984. Okay, and if we run the clock, this is what happened in the wind industry. That's 1990. 95, it's a European business. 2000, almost exclusively European. America's asleep. Asia hasn't woken up. And then we see this. OK? And so you can see the locus of this industry starting to move towards Asia. What does that mean in terms of some of the big competitors? 2005, there's one Chinese wind turbine manufacturer in the top 10, Goldwind, producing 0.7 gigawatt capacity of wind turbines. By 2010, there's Sinovel, Goldwind, 
and uh, Dongfang, three Chinese companies in the top 10. And if you look at Goldwind, has gone from 0.7 to 3.6 gigawatts, it's not, it, and it's not even enough to remain the top Chinese manufacturer. Okay, so in order to stay on that top 10 table, you have to grow your capacity at 25% per year. Right, and this is heavy engineering, this is not easy. These are wind turbines, these are huge things. Let's have a look at solar. That is solar in 2006. Sadly, we don't go back to 84 on solar, but that's solar in 2006, run the clock, and these are additions to um, manufacturing capacity. By 2010, you can see it's almost exclusively an Asian business. So new additions to capacity are all, almost all happening in Asia. So there you go. Back 2006, you can see that there's a couple of Chinese companies, SunTech uh, and China Sunergy. By 2010, JA Solar, SunTech, Yingli, Trina, Canadian Solar. Canadian Solar is Chinese. Uh, and Jinko Solar. <laughs> so we've now got... Uh, of the top 10, we've actually got one, two, three, four, five, six Chinese companies. And by the way, you know, it's not just, you can see there, there's Taiwanese. Now, interestingly, one of the losers here is actually Japan and Taiwan, uh, as you can see. So it's already, it already was, to a certain extent, an Asia business before. So is it all game over? Is it all, you know, should we just give up? Well, this is venture capital and private equity. As you can see, a completely different pattern. So the US still is the home of innovation finance. And I would argue that it, it, it's not just the VC community that's putting more money into, into innovation. Also, if you look at the percentage of, um, of, of revenue that goes into R&D, US corporations, even US corporations in the solar industry, are putting more into R&D. So the one American company in the top 10 in solar, First Solar, is using a completely new technology, thin film, and not just bashing out crystalline silicon. Okay, so the innovation story is very strong in the US. A bigger proportion of the US stimulus funding went to R&D and went to um, loan guarantees for new technologies. So this technology thrust in the US is probably stronger than people realize. You know, the, the dominant narrative is how uh, the US is behind China in this race. It's not as simple as that. If we go back to those international patents, I showed you the clean energy patent surge. Extraordinary. There's actually a sort of top six, um, the, 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 the big countries, Japan, US, Germany, South Korea, France, UK. These are international patents, not the ones that are just used domestically. And there's China down there. So again, on the technology story, it is far from over. If you think that the, the story of energy will just be uh, organic growth from the, of the current technologies, then you'd bet China, you'd bet Asia. If you bet disruptive new technologies, then you'd bet US. And if you bet something in between, then obviously you'll go for something in between, which is very geopolitically interesting. So here's my thought starter, because we're going to be in this very sort of multipolar world where you've got manufacturing in Asia, innovation in the US, big markets in Europe, and so on. What are we going to see? And this is really just a thought starter. This is uh, in the spirit of, of, get, of, of handing over a good, uh, a good provocative set of, uh, of thoughts to, to the panelists and then to you. We already know we're going to see new global corporate players, big companies, companies with heft. And we're going to see new ones, and we are already seeing new ones. Second, competition for jobs and the associated trade tensions. We've already seen this. The Metal Workers Union um, uh, uh, sponsoring um, a trade investigation against China's practices in the wind industry. Um, we've seen uh, the Japanese um, also starting to. I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I'm not. I, I don't want to overqualify what they've done. But um, there is tension between Japan and China, which resulted in uh, a little spat over rare earth metals um, during the course of last year. So we see the same sort of tensions in Germany, whether these very generous um, stimulus, uh, not stimulus, very generous feed-in tariffs, but what people are doing is they're buying now Chinese modules to put on their roofs. And so there's tension uh, all around uh, as a result. We're going to see new resource constraints, rare earths, uh, lithium. So whether the world is used to dealing with the fact that you, know, you have to be very uh, careful about the, uh, plotting the depletion of oil. Do we have to be just as careful about plotting depletion of lanthanum and a whole bunch of things that we've never heard of uh, outside a Tom Lehrer song? 
new economic rents and capital flows. The numbers here are big. You know, when Copenhagen talks about 100 billion a year, that means after 10 years, if we ever get there, that will be a trillion dollars that will be sitting in countries that most of our pension funds or insurance companies are absolutely not comfortable investing in. Even just um, the continuation of those triangles and those trends is tens of billions and then hundreds of billions per year, and then ultimately it will accumulate as trillions. And so there are new economic rents being extracted. We've seen that uh, India, instead of spending 5% per year on oil, who knows, may end up spending that money on Chinese uh, solar equipment. Uh, and that's going to create all sorts of tensions between those two countries. Shifts in trade flows, a substantial new industry that's going to shift who's buying what from whom. It's obviously very linked to my fourth point. Increased vulnerability to hacking, cyber war, terrorism, or just plain old bugs. Because as more of this infrastructure is electronic and is, uh, is controlled electronically, uh, once you have a smart grid, you have a whole lot more vulnerability points. And that's going to be, uh, in fact, we've, we've, we've seen even this week, I think, um, state-sponsored uh, cyber, ha state-sponsored hacking uh, could be considered an act of war. And so I think we're going to see an escalation of tension on that issue. And then, to be very con controversial, or more controversial, a cap on long-term fossil fuel prices. Once you have not just biofuels, but electric vehicles and other solutions, then the chance of a long-term price signal going you know, stratospherically high uh, is eliminated. So oil can always, the price can always spike wherever it wants. But you know, if there's, uh, those who think there's going to be an oil price at $200 because of the rise of China and the rise of India and whatever, they are just wrong. Because at those oil prices, there are other things that we now can do. Right? So at the very least, we're going to see a cap on fossil fuel prices and accelerating reduction in demand for coal and oil. And if anybody, you know, coal is the easy one because we're already seeing it's practically impossible to build a new coal-fired power station outside China. Right? If you take ex-China, the, the construction of new energy capacity, 13% of it was coal last year, just 13%. China, of course, is still building a whole bunch of coal. But it's going to become harder and harder, even within China, to build new coal. And ultimately, I think we'll see accelerating reduction. Now, I'm not talking about next year. I'm talking about decades. Whether it's two decades, whether it's three decades, whether it's four decades, whether it's five decades, that it will depend on, on lots of those trends uh, and others elsewhere in the world. Um, but you know, this is about geopolitics. This is not about what happens tomorrow. Uh, and so I, I offer that as my final sort of controversial thought that ultimately we could well see uh, accelerating reduction in demand and then it would probably make sense to start thinking about what does that do for global stability and stability in some of the countries that are dependent on flows of funds from uh, coal and oil uh, for their uh, gross national product or to, 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 um, uh, to maintain their standard of living for their populations. So I hope that was sufficiently controversial to hand Absolutely. over or hand back to Sarah <laughs> or directly. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. No, I think that was actually an excellent uh, stage setting for uh, Claude's comments, you know, certainly laying out there a world in which, I guess, as you put it, alternatives uh, will have to contend with a lot of the really positive things that you see happening on the clean energy space. Um, but as we sort of handed the question over to Claude was the question of, of how does clean energy, energy sort of compete with the energy that's in the conventional energy space? And what are some of the dynamics going on there that will sort of influence some of the trends that, that Michael has laid out so far? Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, I apologize because uh, I have no slides and I realize that it's not very fair for you because it makes even more difficult for you to understand my poor English. <laughs> uh, well, try to make an effort, please. Uh, as, you, as you were told, I have been the boss of the International Energy Agency for some years. And uh, of course, I will uh, rely very much on uh, the work made by the IEA uh, for my presentation. While now, uh, I am the boss of a team of one person, myself. 
<laughs> that is one of the reasons why I have no slides, I have to say. <laughs> 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 well, the old geopolitics was perhaps only six months ago. Six months ago, there was the release of the uh, traditional yearly World Energy Outlook of the IEA. And uh, the message of the, uh, of the release of the 2010 uh, WEO was the usual uh, three E's of the IEA. You may know what the three E's are. The, the motto that a sound energy policy has to be about energy security, the first E, economic growth, the second E, and environment protection, the third E, and that uh, the three of them have to stand alone very strongly together. Uh, so uh, the WIO 2010 was very strong, as always, and that, with a very strong warning on CO2 emissions, it was just before Cancun. The risk that uh, CO2 emissions were uh, rising out of control and with the conclusion that we needed more of everything. More energy efficiency, more renewables, more nuclear, more CCS, etc. More gas instead of coal. And a number of good news in, uh, at that time. The first good news was that some renewable costs are close to cost effectiveness. That was said by my predecessor, and that's absolutely true. Uh, that's true for uh, our close to be competitive for uh, photovoltaic in sunny countries, not everywhere. Uh, that's true for onshore wind, not offshore. Uh, that true for uh, Brazil ethanol, not for corn ethanol. Well, we have to be cautious, but we see some renewables very close to becoming competitive. The second good news, I'm speaking six months ago, was that nuclear is back on the front burner and uh, many projects. The third good news was that uh, there is plenty of cheap gas available, thanks to the shale gas in the US and elsewhere. And the fourth good news was that there seemed to be an implicit consensus between oil consumers and oil con producers that a price of $80 per barrel is acceptable. Is acceptable for consumers because it favors efficiency and alternatives. It's acceptable for producers because it's high enough, but it does not destroy demand. It allows economic recovery. And I see that as a reason why for uh, two years, more or less, price of oil was not that volatile. It was not too far from $80 a barrel. So the result for uh, the IEA was to say, uh, we see the picture. It is concerning, mainly on CO2 emissions. But there are some good news. Now, please, governments, do what you have to do. Six months, six months later, the new geopolitics, I don't know, but the new picture. First, I would like to say that in one sense, the new picture is the same as the old one. I mean that uh, the three E's are as relevant as ever. We still need security of supply. We still need energy, uh, uh, environment protection, and we still need economic growth. But there has been a number of new events 
Some of them were totally unexpected, which have changed radically the picture. And I would like to, to mention four of them. The first one is Cancun. It was not unexpected, but the results of Cancun uh, should be carefully uh, analyzed. Second, the so-called Arab Spring. Third, of course, uh, uh, Fukushima. And fourth, which is not, was not unexpected either, but somehow forgotten, uh, is that in many democratic countries, 2012 is an election year. Cancun first. After the so-called failure of Copenhagen, Cancun was deemed as a so-called success. <laughs> it was not a total failure in Copenhagen. It is far from being a total success in Cancun, of course. But uh, I think that in Cancun, the, after Cancun, the bike is still running. But I think <laughs> that it is increasingly clear uh, that uh, the top-down negotiation with the ambition of having a comprehensive uh, uh, agreement signed by 192 countries is out of reach for many years. And that if we want to make some progress, we have also to have a bottom-up approach which may succeed. What you have seen a few minutes ago is that China is totally prepared to make a lot of progress to reduce CO2 emissions, or at least to reduce CO2 intensity of its GDP. A lot of progress, perhaps more than any other country in the world. But China does not want to be tied by an international agreement. We have to take that into account. So Cancun is a success, but uh, not a very clear path forward. Arab Spring. Many things to say on Arab Spring. spring. I will uh, only uh, focus on uh, the consequences for uh, the price of oil. Uh, of course, some oil is, is missing right now, mainly from Libya, also from Yemen to a, less, a lesser extent. Some other places are at risk. And uh, inter interestingly enough, the missing barrels have not been balanced by an increase in production from fellow uh, OPEC countries, contrary to what was said. And if you look at the figure, for instance, uh, OPEC crude supply was more than 30 million barrels per day in January, less than nine, uh, 29, that means more than 1 million barrel less in March. And uh, I think it is interesting to understand why. I think that the reason, the main reason wh why, is that avoiding unrest in OPEC countries, in Arab countries, but many Arab countries are OPEC countries, and many OPEC countries are Arab countries, uh, avoiding unrest bears a huge additional social burden. Take the Saudi example. The king of Saudi, of Saudi Arabia, sometime in February, or I think, I don't remember, came back to the kingdom, coming from uh, health recovery in uh, the US and in Morocco, and decided that uh, it was time to give uh, some perks to uh, his uh, citizens in order to avoid unrest. And the amount of the perks is 140 billion Saudi rials per year, which means 37 
billion US dollars a year. It's a very pleasant number because it's easy to divide it by the number of uh, days in a year. It makes almost exactly $100 million a day. If you remember that uh, Saudi Arabia produced a little bit less than 10 million barrels per day, you understand that just to give the money which is necessary to pay for the perks, you need an increase of $10 a barrel price. And that's the reason why I really think that uh, for a foreseeable future, uh, the price of oil will not go down, it will go up because Saudi Arabia is just an example, a major example, but the, 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 the picture is the same for most uh, OPEC countries. Uh, so uh, that m seems to be a strong contradiction from my predecessor. It is not, because I am not speaking uh, about five decades. I am speaking about five years or 10 years, perhaps. Let us see later, I don't know. Uh, the, in the short run, the only possibility for me, uh, in my view, to have a severe drop in oil price, well, there are two. The first one would be uh, a sudden uh, solution in the Iranian crisis. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Certainly, that would make a huge change on the oil and gas <laughs> picture. And the second, which I hope will not happen, would be a severe recession worldwide, which, of course, would bring uh, the price of oil down. Fukushima disaster. And again, I focus only on the consequences on the energy picture. There will be, that has been said, there will be much less uh, uh, nuclear in the world. In Japan, of course. In uh, some countries in Europe, Germany has announced, Switzerland too. Some other countries are uh, reflecting again, Italy. Certainly much less nuclear uh, in, uh, in the US, just because the increased cost of uh, security will make nuclear absolutely non-competitive here, in particular compared to gas. Uh, so uh, what will replace the expected nuclear output? More renewable, certainly, much more. But also more gas and even more coal. It is possible to build coal plants in Europe. It is possible to, be, to build new coal plants in Germany right now. It's a pity, but that's the case. So all those new events give uh, conflicting uh, messages for the three E's. And uh, in particular, uh, the consequences of the Fukushima disaster are potentially very bad for uh, global warming issues. So you could expect uh, that governments uh, to should decide very strong measures in order to keep the trends on track and to keep the policies as sound as possible. Which are these uh, policies? Uh, accelerate nuclear programs wherever it is possible to do so. Develop alternatives to traditional uh, fossil fuels, such as shale oil and shale gas. Uh, strongly promote carbon capture and storage. Strongly maintain uh, the 
incentives for uh, 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 renewable and help citizens understand that they have to listen to price signals and that if the prices are high, that just means that they have to become serious in energy efficiency. I regret to say that in many countries, at least in Europe, I will speak now mainly about Europe, which I know better. You will tell me whether it's the same in the US. I'm not sure. In many countries, the opposite is occurring. First, uh, on nuclear, nobody dares speaking ag again about nuclear. The only ones who want to speak about nuclear are the ones which are staunch opponents. So the new nuclear programs, even in, uh, in countries such as mine, which uh, is generally viewed as uh, totally addict to nuclear, uh, I'm not sure that it will happen that way. Shale gas exploration is banned in some countries, including France because some people uh, have viewed the movie, how was the, the, the name of the movie? Gasland, yes. CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, is not explained at all by governments. Not explained. That means that people do not understand what it is, do not understand what it means, and uh, the result is very simple. It's not yet banned, but it's the absolute syndrome not in my backyard. And uh, on prices. Sadly enough, governments tend to bend to the public opinion, and the public opinion thinks that prices are too high. Uh, and the result is that some price ceilings are put in place in some countries to protect the consumer from market signals. Some uh, taxes are taken from the taxpayer to the oil consumers. Uh, that is the election year effect, which is particularly concerning because the general public would like to have energy which is abundant, which is secure, which is clean, which is not radioactive, which is not in my backyard, and which is not expensive at the same time. And nobody stands to explain that all that exists, but only in the kingdom of utopia. Uh, we have a word in French. I don't know whether it is easily trans uh, possible to translate it in, in English. In French, it is uh, je suis leur chef, donc je les suis. As I am their leader, I follow them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not... <laughs> it's not what we expect uh, from uh, leadership. So, uh, that will be the end of my presentation, which is a rather pessimistic one. <laughs> it's, it's not at all uh, about long-term issues. It's about short-term issues. It's about next year, next decade. I don't see, for the time being, mainly in Europe, I don't see governments able to take the good decisions because they need to give a lot of explanation to explain what a good policy could, should be and what is possible and what is not possible. And uh, they do not seem to be brave enough to do that. So the good news, I don't know, but the hope is that uh, the private sector uh, will make the good bets. And at that point, I fully uh, join uh, my predecessor. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Claude. Yes, certainly there's agreement on sort of the drivers of the trends from both of our first two speakers on being energy, environment, and security. Um, and perhaps a bit of a pessimistic outlook on our ability to drive policies in a consolidated direction. Uh, next, we'll hear from Doug about the new geopolitics uh, of clean energy. Great, thank you. Thank you all. Um, and thank you, Sarah and Michael and Claude, for a wonderful uh, stage setting uh, information and, and I think uh, prompting us to think uh, more deeply and broadly about the the evolving landscape in front of us for, uh, for, for energy and for clean energy in particular. Um, so you've all been uh, listening patiently. Uh, let me uh, indulge your patience for about 10 more minutes uh, while I go through a, a bit of a, of a, of a set of formal uh, remarks and then uh, maybe we can just relax into a conversation. Uh, so uh, bear with me if I go through this uh, relatively quickly, but I think uh, uh, many of these points uh, you'll, you'll recognize uh, into a synthesis of, uh, of a thesis really around the evolving landscape. Um, I want to come back to a couple pieces that, uh, that have been touched on, but just re-highlight them in certain ways. And I, and I do this with a couple of headlines. The first is uh, a new competitive landscape, global energy and environmental policy trends and their implications. This one was for America, uh, but it was put out by the Business Roundtable. You can actually um, find some of those results online. Very interesting pieces in terms of looking at competitive landscape, uh, some of the protectionist policies, uh, some of the domestic uh, content policies, trade tariffs and things like that that came out in there as well. Um, there are a couple others. Uh, come back to national security and the threat of climate change. Now climate change, of course, is a couple of steps back on energy, but energy and mitigation of, uh, of CO2 emissions uh, from the energy sector, uh, clearly very important in how to, uh, both mitigate future climate change, but also the need to adapt to it. There are some very strong implications there that we need to think about when we think about the geopolitics. Trade and climate change as well. Uh, we need to think about that. There is a little bit of literature on that, not a lot, but this uh, report by WTO and UNEP started to, started to look at that and really look at both the implications of the footprint of trade, but also the implications on trade. And I think as Michael uh, hinted to, uh, but didn't say as, I think, as forthrightly as he would like to uh, have. Uh, so <laughs> I'll put the words in my mouth, is that um, I think we're really going to see a very strong changing dynamic uh, on trade and trade policies going, going forward, uh, really working very, very differently from uh, a resource-based trade economic and dynamics to a product-based uh, energy trade uh, dynamic that we really need to th think very, very deeply about. And then uh, finally, uh, there's actually some very interesting but very small uh, and, uh, and academic literature. There's, there's a fair amount about it in the trade press as well, uh, and certainly in the dialogue in Washington, which is about rethinking the role of the state in technology development. And I think that uh, that bears fruit through uh, a fair number of the stimulus packages. But those stimulus packages in detail uh, and we can talk about that in, in, in the dialogue, really look quite differently. Uh, many are focused, uh, certainly the US ones, as Michael said, are very focused on innovation on the early stage of that pipeline with essentially the, the hope that they will be embraced by industry and then brought to the market in, uh, in uh, products and suites uh, which are compelling to the customer to buy. And that, that, that contrasts very strongly to uh, um, stimulus packages, which were very market oriented in many other countries, where there's a rush to the marketplace and subsequent investment in the manufacturing, and then perhaps if there's sufficient product, there's then enough reinvestment back in the innovation pipeline. Very different dynamics and perspectives of how one addresses innovation, and I'll, I'll talk about that just a little bit more. But these emerging dynamics really touch on a kind of six six points, and I'm not going to go through all of them in some detail, but I just want to highlight them here. And they raise, uh, they're raised more for discussion and questions uh, to come uh, from our dialogue as well as from you all. Strategic minerals, I'll, I'll mention that just a briefly in a little bit more detail. We've talked a little bit about competition and there's certainly much more to be had on that one. I want to reintroduce the environmental E that Claude spoke of and actually um, disaggregated a little bit. 
uh, because it's much more uh, intricately uh, uh, focused in terms of understanding local, regional, and global environmental uh, uh, impacts. And this is not just the air quality, but water quality as well. That's driving some decisions about shale fracking. It's driving decisions about local air quality issues in China, for example. Uh, it's also potentially very strongly related to regional conflict around water, uh, as well as uh, trans-border uh, air-related air, uh, contaminants, et cetera. Infrastructure challenges uh, are, are those that really need to be thought through, although they're on a very long-term time frame, but they're very important relative to domestic policies and how one builds the appropriate infrastructure for an evolving uh, energy sector itself. Trade issues, of course, uh, as we spoke of, and then clean energy for development. I think we can't lose track of that, particularly in relation to, I think, a lot of the uh, fundamental uh, issues uh, that are related to, uh, to some of the uh, uprisings uh, relative to economic prosperity, economic opportunity, uh, and, and employment uh, that we've seen uh, really come to a head over the last uh, number of months. Uh, on minerals, I, I always thought it would be interesting to, to put this chart up, uh, which is going to be a little bit of an eye strain for those in the back, uh, but at the, and it will remind you of your, your chemistry days. Uh, so those are all the chemical symbols of, uh, of many of the, of, the, of the primary elements, the primary atoms, uh, the, with the atomic number. And I won't bore you with the details here, uh, but this basically shows the abundance of those relative to silicon atoms based upon uh, USGS uh, assessments uh, that have been done, uh, I think, in 2007. The, the rare earth elements are actually not rare per se. That's actually a nomenclature from the chemical table. Uh, those are the ones in blue. Uh, they actually are relatively abundant, uh, particularly compared to iridium, osmium, platinum, uh, gold even, and rhenium, which are these ones over on the far right. Uh, but they are relatively uh, uh, less abundant uh, than um, things that we're very familiar with, like silicon, oxygen, uh, iron, and calcium. Uh, but this shows that there actually is a fair suite of opportunity to actually play with the chemical mixes of certain technologies. Uh, which is very much on the radar screen of uh, certainly the Japanese uh, and the U.S. photovoltaic manufacturers as they think about uh, which technologies they want to pursue for, uh, for the solar learning curves. And there are some options on dealing with strategic, strategic minerals. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but uh, there's everything from multiple sourcing, if one can in, in certainly entice the, the uh, mining companies uh, to move forward, and you can get through the environmental permitting and the local issues to really uh, fundamentally redesign of the materials pathways as well, all the way to what we've really seen very strongly uh, come forward uh, in Europe over the last decade or more, which is essentially mandates for 100% recycling requirements. And, and I think that that's, uh, that's another pathway that really needs to be thought through. And that, so there's a combination, again, of market-based mechanisms or policy instruments uh, as, well as, as well as mandates there. Um, I put this slide up, I, I think, to be, uh, in some sense, a, a little bit provocative uh, uh, relative to a myth of why a lot of manufacturing has left, uh, certainly, the U.S., uh, particularly in the clean energy sector. Uh, and so I'm not going to talk about other sectors, but in the clean energy sector itself. And this one is very specific to silicon photovoltaics. And it's an analysis done uh, by colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And, um, I would say um, if I hadn't put the slide up with the detail and I'd asked how many people think that it's labor costs driving manufacturing to China, I would have got a, a relative majority uh, of folks uh, raising their hands. Um, this analysis shows, and you can see by the little red arrows, the slice of labor uh, in a, uh, an, a, a photovoltaic module manufacturing costs and then total delivery of a price uh, to Germany in the US, China, and Malaysia. And you can see even in the US today, it's uh, only about 10% of the total costs. The other costs are dominated by uh, materials, uh, depreciation, and some other things uh, like that. Um, the real uh, story actually turns out to be uh, a lot of manufacturing policy uh, relative to uh, tax policy, the cost of money, uh, the tenor of money, et cetera, that, uh, that is driving a lot of those decisions. And you can see some competitive response to that coming forward. 
On the innovation policy portfolio, particularly related to clean energy, um, there's not only the patent issue that Michael talked about, which I think is very compelling as a positive story going forward to think about US competitiveness in the landscape, but I, th I put this slide up really to, to um, illustrate the fact that it's not a linear value chain to think about in terms of success of bringing new technologies to market. Now, a lot of the policies that were um, highlighted in Michael's remarks actually are oriented on the market side of the equation. Those are feed-in tariffs, renewable portfolio standards, et cetera. Whereas if you look at the US and we have focused our innovation policies a fair amount on the invention side innovation through R, D, D, and D, which are the primary instruments, which are then complemented by other policies in the marketplace, particularly those uh, that we've talked about and, and certainly are in the federal dialogue about a federal clean energy standard, portfolio standard, and tax credits and things like that. And you can see a complement of opportunity there in terms of putting together a policy portfolio that may, that may align more appropriately with the structure and the, and the political economy uh, within which it's, it's uh, really put in place. Um, again, not to go through this in detail, but this is some of the, those policies. This was highlighted in a National Academy report on uh, policy options for mitigating climate change. Uh, it actually came from uh, some work by Ed Rubin and, and a few others. And there are a few of these which are actually quite related to broader national geopolitical issues. Things like patent protection and IP law and, and IP trade. Um, government procurement, uh, which, which may or may not necessarily include uh, domestic content requirements and things like that. So not to go through this all in general, but they're, they're there uh, for your reference later on. But I think the, the point here is to keep in mind is that there is a broad suite of policies uh, on a domestic front, many of them on a geopolitical front that really need to be thought about. So let me come back to, to Claude's uh, three E's, uh, which I think we certainly here uh, at, at CSIS in our dialogue have talked about for, for many years. Uh, and they are, again, related to energy security, the economic prosperity, and the environment. And I think the, the preamble dialogue all the way through, and I'll, 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 I'll tee up a discussion here by saying, yes, these are, these are still very important principles to follow through with and to base good sound policy on. But let me then also articulate the fact that I think that the three E's are now within a much more complex environment and we have to now think more broadly because we not only have to deal with what I'll call the traditional geopolitics of energy as they have been six months or 12 months or even five or 10 years ago, but the new evolving geopolitics of clean energy, which are around strategic minerals, intellectual property, other trade, and recognizing the fact that the environment itself has local issues which are driving, which are driving policy, competitiveness which comes very strongly into play, development issues which comes back to in fact geopolitical security issues, not energy security, but but political security issues. And these all very much come into the dialogue and the debate about what this evolution and emerging trends are in the clean energy policy environment and geopolitics. So I'll end my formal remarks there and look forward to the dialogue. I thought that, 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 that actually teased well. Thank you. Well, we've got three very thought-provoking presentations. And I think I'd like to just take the opportunity to ask you guys a, a question. I mean, all three of you brought up the drivers, right? And here we call this sort of the, the energy triangle, the energy policy triangle, which is, you know, the security environment uh, and economics. You know, one of the interesting things about clean energy and one of the reasons why we took up the clean energy vernacular here uh, in CSIS is, you know, for the past few years, we'd been talking about low carbon energy and secure low carbon pathways. And that's really what we had been focusing on. And from our view, you know, or at least from my view, what's happened over the last uh, year or so is that this, this new terminology on clean energy has really reflected what's happened um, out there in the energy space, which is less of a concern over the global climate challenge as being the primary driver, the overarching driver for what was going to be moving clean energy or so-called clean energy into 
uh, uh, the conventional uh, uh, energy space um, to one that's a little bit less certain. And Michael, you had talked about it saying that you know, there's, a, there's a solid policy foundation, but it's a bit less certain than you know, folks in the industry would like to see. Um, uh, and, and you also talked about it as well as being sort of you know different drivers, whether they're being local, environmental versus security. The, the question I have in general is, what's the big difference in terms of the future you see for clean energy development without a climate change driver that we expected to see coming out of Copenhagen? And we've all talked about how Cancun maybe didn't set the framework that we all thought to see. Right now, we sort of focused, we all focused on sort of competitiveness issues. So what's the difference in the future you see for clean energy technology if competitiveness is now the main driver rather than a low carbon pathway? That's a really, really difficult question. <laughs> um, That's why I'm asking. <laughs> and and, and the, the reason is because we're in this sort of, it's a very odd time. I don't think this is the new normal. I think this is a... This is, a, this is a pendulum in motion that we're seeing. And so just as the pendulum got way too overcommitted to climate change as a driver of, of, of investment and of policy and of activity, uh, and you had this absurd things where I think it was um, you know, Gordon Brown who said, we've got, was it, two weeks to save the world about Copenhagen. I mean, this is an absurd you know, uh, you know, flight of rhetoric over what's essentially an international you know, negotiation about a very tough issue. And now you see the pendulum coming, sort of shooting back, where, um, where the US public uh, a lot of publics around the world have now decided they are simply too, you know, there's a few people who are ultras on either side, the bulk have just decided they're too confused and they kind of need a rest from the whole climate thing. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean, by the way, that it's gone away. You know, the physics haven't changed and the climate science actually continues to build uh, as it does. Um, so I don't think that you can judge it's not like oh well now we need a new a, a new reason there's going to be a new paradigm I think that you know I think that you know, Doug's put his finger on it it is just very complicated because um, the what's happening now is that we've sort of had a rapid education in in energy and its links to environmental challenges particularly climate and now everybody's sitting there going wow this is really complicated mm -hmm. You've got jobs, and you've got new technologies, and you've got local impacts, and you've got climate, and you've got all these. Th and, and so I think if I could try and interpret what we've heard using actually Doug's framework, is because of all of these different issues, it's kind of we're going to see 10 years of intense instability, just an unwillingness. There's no clear direction that the buffalo herd is going to make off it uh, for 10 years. And then I'm going to come back to my economic trends and say that ultimately those things will win. Mm -hmm. And so that will, then, that will then lead the realignment will be around uh, the economics. And you know, because I'm an optimistic chap, I would say that you, they will actually tick all of those boxes because you, know, what, you, can actually, you can actually square those circles using some of these new technologies as they, as they come through. So we will see climate being addressed at the same time as local environmental issues, at the same time as some of the geopolitical issues and so on. So, mm -hmm. you know, but as I say, that, that may be more to do with me being optimistic than, uh, than, than uh, what's, what we're really going to see. Mm -hmm. But I think that the next 10 years is going to look very different from the 10 years after. Yeah. Now, what do you think? Do you feel like we're uh, Claude or, or Doug? Claude? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the global warming issues have disappeared from the radar screen. Not, uh, first, as uh, Michael said, uh, uh, the problem uh, is still there. It has not changed. Uh, but what I think is that there has been two, two, two problems which have uh, uh, changed the view we have. The first one is that in uh, many countries where uh, there was a strong uh, effort to uh, deploy uh, renewables, that has been made at costs which were increasingly viewed as absurd. It was the feed-in tariffs in Europe in particular. Uh, the, the, it is absurd because it means that you develop photovoltaic systems not in places where there is sun, but in places where there is a feed-in tariff, which uh, uh, does not mean necessarily it is the best place. So uh, now that has changed because uh, every government has realized that uh, scarce money scarcity is a problem too. 
And that's the reason why in, uh, even in Germany, uh, the feed-in tariff has decreased. In France, it has decreased a lot. In some places, like in uh, Spain, it has totally been changed. That's the first point. And the second point is that I think that now there are more pressing issues. The problem with global warming is that we will see what happens in some years and some decades. And today, the public opinion wants some issues to be solved immediately. They do not want any more nuclear. They do not want any more uh, shale gas. They do not want any more this, this, that. And the governments, well, I am repeating what I was saying. The, government, the governments have to address the short-term issues, or think they have to address the short-term issues before addressing the long-term issues. I think. That's the reason why we have the feeling that uh, global warming is less an issue uh, right now. And maybe you're right. I'm not sure. I hope not, because otherwise uh, the situation would become very, very difficult in some decades from now. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a, a couple thoughts that it, in, in some sense reflect uh, a little bit of Michael's uh, uh, reaction as well. Um, I don't think climate has, uh, has been lost on those making investments and those uh, working through the sector. I think it's, it's lost its luster, if I can use that term. But it's still there. Um, it is a long-term issue. And even if there were an international agreement, um, the potential economic implications of that agreement on the marginal next dollar to be invested would not necessarily be very substantial for many, many decades to come until some overall constraint uh, became much more, much more binding. So for example, if one looks at uh, effective price uh, per ton of carbon, uh, it won't get really constraining on the economics for a long period of time, but people will make investments today understanding that it will increase. They're still making those investments today understanding Eventually, it will increase. They just have bigger uncertainty bounds uh, on, their, on their analysis. Uh, but that's in a context of understanding that the energy system is both large uh, and represents very high capital, uh, long-lived assets. And I think people recognize more today than they did three years ago or even six months ago that pursuing a diversity pathway with much more clean energy in it is, offers them the ability to address many of the policy goals that they're trying to achieve collectively without the risks associated with a I'll call it, traditional energy pathway. Mm -hmm. And why is it, you know, I, I was just thinking if I had put together a different panel and flipped this uh, forum on its head, um, we would be having a conversation about how clean energy technology, the experience curves that you put up there, are all well and good, but when you look at them on scale for what sort of the conventional energy system has out there, well, these experience curves have always been out there and it's always been 10 or 20 years away. Um, and when you scale these things up to a larger, uh, uh, you know, say something like wind or renewables, they might have exceptional growth rates, but it's still going to take a very long time um, for them to be able to compete with a conventional energy system. From a geopolitical perspective, and this is probably a tougher question, why, why do the two fields always have to compete with one another? And why is it an either or discussion between the clean energy community and the conventional energy community? And it's, it's specifically you know, kind of interesting now that we've got what we've got going on in the nuclear space and then also the natural gas space that are you know, major energy sources that when you put your slides together, it's, it's hard to scale them on the same place that you do with some of the other renewables. Um, but they're trying to sort of fight for that clean energy space as well. Why, why do we have sort of that either or dichotomy? So first to the, to the point about scale, I think that what's really interesting now uh, in this discussion versus perhaps the 1980s, the 1990s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, is that this stuff is happening at scale for the first time. So if you look at um, even, uh, you know, if it's wind in Texas, which is 7 or 8% of, of the energy demand, it's being met by, by clean energy in Texas. 
Um, in Spain, it's something like 13, 14, 15, I think it's about 16 percent, something like that now. Mm -hmm. uh, Denmark, over 20 percent. Germany, uh, 11 or 12 percent. Uh, and so these are, these are not the trivial, you know, not point something something, which was what people associate obviously with solar. Uh, you know, it's still very, very small, you know, sub, sub 1 percent most places. I think Spain, 3 percent now of energy supply is solar, and Germany, extraordinarily the same. You know, and I agree entirely uh, how inappropriate that is. Um, so now you're getting to the point, though, when you talk about 5 percent, 10 percent, and then you start thinking, well, hang on, you know, that's going to go to 15, that's going to go to 20 percent. And of course, these are the mo this is marginal high cost demand very often. So um, you know, it, it, it only needs to take a couple of million barrels a day of demand out of oil for it to start to affect oil prices, because these are the marginal, these are the expensive barrels that get taken out of the system. And so I think what's happening, one answer, part of an answer to your question, is that um, there is now a real competition in the sense that you can meet your energy demand, your electricity demand, or your transport demand two ways, meaningfully, for the first time. And so that generates competition. And the other place, there's two other places where there's competition. Um, one is in the capital markets. Well, there's a perception that there's only so much money to go around. And so if in the UK, for instance, if we fund offshore wind, then there won't be any money for nuclear. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there's all sorts of positioning and jostling, even though offshore, offshore wind right now is, I don't know, one gigawatt or something. It's nothing. Uh, but of course, the plan is to add 30 gigawatts or some enormous amount. And then that is so expensive that will we be able to? So the, there's this perception. I personally believe there's plenty of money uh, you know, if, the, if the, the, um, the economics are, are, are right. And then the second environment where there's competition is in regulation. Mm. The way that electricity markets or energy markets are structured can either be to the advantage of nuclear, in the case of taking the, continuing with the example of the UK, you can either figure out how to remunerate producers who invest in nuclear or in wind, but it's sort of hard to create the egg-laying wool milk pig in terms of regulation, you know, the, the single <laughs> farm animal that does everything. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, and that's the goal, you know, so it was to say, well, it will drown, if somebody wants to build nuclear, we, it will do that, and if somebody wants to do uh, wind, it will do it. And so what tends to happen is there's a battle over what regulation do you see. Um, and that obviously is then you get sort of competitive lobbying or competitive uh, pressures from the different camps. So I think that the, number one, the competition is real because it, clean energy is growing. And then there's a couple of battlefields, which are real battlefields. And, uh, and so we're going to see that, as I say, the next 10 years, you're going to see that playing out around the world. Mm -hmm. Glad. Uh, I mean, on, uh, on the system side, as we look at the, certainly the power system itself in particular, um, there is a lot of opportunity for complements uh, as the system operates. So, and, and we'll see that even in Germany as it goes forward with its uh, decommissioning of nuclear and advancing of, 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 uh, of renewables in, in, in their system, they will do a, a fair amount of, I'll call it system level planning, where they've got fast ramping gas plants, for example, to help uh, match demand and supply. We see that uh, same complementarity play out uh, in scenarios in the United States as well. So technically, there's, there's complement. I think Michael is absolutely correct. On the marginal dollar for investment, it's competitive. And, and people need to, uh, you know, that, that, that always is that competition right there. Mm -hmm. and, and on the regulation side as well, they, they battle for mind share, shall we say. It's <laughs> a good term. Claude, did you have anything to add? Uh, I think that uh, it is difficult to forget when you discuss about competition that competition will be fair uh, if there is a price for CO2 emissions, which is more or less the case in Europe, I, uh, rather less than more because the price is too low. Uh, phasing out nuclear in Germany will have one good point, it will increase the cost of CO2 permits certainly very much. That's a good news. Uh, but uh, we need that. Uh, the second point to remember, always speaking about Europe uh, is we will have to look it with a lot of interest to what will happen globally for Europe because Europe is supposed to have a single energy market but a decision to phase out nuclear has been taken by only one country. Uh, what will happen? Uh, probably during the 
next uh, 10 years, well, uh, a, little, a little bit later, there will be a lot of uh, energy, and in particular of power, will, will have to be imported to Germany from other countries. Will it be coal? Will it be nuclear, French nuclear? Will, it be, uh, will, will, will the German be willing? Will the French be willing, by the way? Uh, will it come from a Saharian country at a very high cost? I mean, there is still a lot of unresolved questions, and as public money is something which is scarce, uh, we need to make sure that competition works. I think competition is good. It helps uh, resulting in the least cost option. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a lot of trends today. And I'm, after this, I'll open it up for some questions from our audience. Um, we've talked about a lot of trends today, you know, things like um, uh, competition over strategic minerals or uh, some of the trade issues emerging over the policies. <laughs> green industrial policies or green protectionist policies, depending on how you look at them, that are being implemented in different countries, um, the unconventional gas revolution, the potential solar revolution. Michael has said that you know, maybe for the next 10 years, we might be in a period of chaos. But if you're looking out you know, as to the key sort of you know, geopolitical dynamics or trends that are of a concern, either positively or negatively, for the clean technology space here, um, over the next few years, what would they be? I mean, what, what do you watch or think about as being a potential uh, game changer in one direction or the other here? So I'll, I'll, I think that the really big game changer potentially is the electric vehicle. Mm. Um, so we're watching very carefully what are the take up rates, what are the resale values of the cars that are being introduced because um, there you really end up, um, you, you do a number of things. Um, the combination of electric vehicles with solar, electric vehicles with wind, is incredibly powerful because now you're introducing storage into the network and local storage. So it enables uh, a, a completely different sort of you know, t type of, uh, well, it, it, it will enable different value to be put on solar power and on intermittent wind. And so that's, a, I think, a potential um, game changer to the positive. Um, the other one that I would mention as well um, which I left out of my remarks, actually you, you called me on it, uh, Doug, which is correct, is um, the developing world. What we're seeing now is that the clean technologies are competitive in the developing world in a way that they're not yet in the developed world. Because if you've not got a grid and you want to bring electricity to rural Africa or rural Asia or Latin America, um, then it's a whole lot cheaper uh, to do it without building a grid than saying, well, first we've got to build a centralized power station, then we've somehow got to do uh, hundreds of miles uh, of pylons. And um, so now there's extraordinary figures. An example, um, uh, Bangladesh, 870,000 homes with solar power, uh, not subsidized. Kick-started by some NGOs, but not subsidized. Uh, financed because they don't buy kerosene anymore. Mm -hmm. um, in Africa, um, hybrid wind solar battery power for telecom t uh, towers. Why? Because it's so expensive to buy diesel mm. and then to lug it out uh, to where these towers are. Uh, and you're seeing that around the developing world. They're actually adopting these technologies much more quickly than you'd expect. And so again, coming back to my telecoms example, you know, India has gone from a couple of million mobile phones in 2000 to 400 million in a decade. Mm. And almost you know, I, I, I challenge the analyst that said that they forecast those numbers. And I'd love to see the data monitor report on that one. Probably out by an order of magnitude or two. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so we could be on the verge of seeing something very similar. Kenya now, 65% of people have a mobile phone, 25% are grid connected. That means 45% of Kenyans wake up every day wondering how they're going to charge their phone. Now that would suggest that the priority of solving you know, the energy uh, problem is, is way up there for Kenyans. And so I think we're going to see some very rapid um, you know, changes in the developing world. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are my two good uh, sort of positive potential game change, electric vehicles, developing world. Okay. Let me throw in two, if I might. I'll, I'll go next. Uh, the, fir the first one is probably not a radical game changer, but it's an evolving awareness uh, that we've dealt with some here in our discussions. Uh, and it's very much on the local, regional, uh, environmental issue that derives directly into the economics, and it's the energy, climate, water issue. Mm. So let me throw water in. Uh, I know, Michael, you've, you've started a new 
a new service uh, oriented toward water technologies and water investments, which I think uh, I applaud you for. Uh, but it is, uh, it's very much on the radar screen domestically uh, in terms of uh, uh, power plant uh, use, thermal generation, et cetera, uh, if folks are not familiar with that. It is an issue globally. Uh, and it's even more of an issue if you look at long-term decarbonization, particularly of thermal plants, uh, because the water requirement for going to carbon capture and storage is under today's technology two and a half times more uh, than the water use uh, in typical uh, cooling systems today, as well as uh, an increase of 30 to 50 percent on the energy front as well. Uh, that plays across the board uh, for many different technologies exclusive of, in fact, uh, PV and wind. Uh, which have very low water footprints. Um, the second one, uh, and, and maybe this is kind of a, a wrap-up comment uh, uh, for my own thoughts, is that uh, we're going to see an increasingly complex policy environment which has to deal with, I'll call it, concentrated energy resources and the, what I'll call uh, uh, the defense of them, the, the strategic geopolitical context of really looking out uh, for the, the ability to extract and move those resources globally to serve energy markets and dealing with this new complexity of distributed domestic energy resources and the essentially intellectual property manufacturing and services industries that are needed in order to take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. And dealing with both of those together uh, will, I think, make it a game-changing, difficult environment mm -hmm. to, to, to develop policy in. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Very quickly, I, I fully agree on uh, the electric car. I fully agree it can be a game-changer if it is a success, in particular because it is a, a way to reconnect two markets which, were, which are right now <coughs> increasingly disconnected, which, is, which are the market, the energy market for transportation, oil and biofuels, and the market for power, which is all the other fuels, coal, uh, gas, nuclear, renewables. <coughs> and if it can be reconnected, well, it will be a game changer for the marketplace, too. Thank you. OK, we've got about 10 minutes <coughs> for questions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of questions, because we'll probably only get one go at this. For those of you who have been here before, you know the ground rules. Please state your name and affiliation. Please wait for the microphone. Please make your question short, and please in the form of a question. Thank you. OK, right there in the middle, and then over on the side there. <coughs> Suresh Karamella from the Department of State. Um, so great presentations. Thank you. Um, sometimes this, this issue is easier to think about overseas than in the US. So I'll bring you back to the US. And it seems to me it's much harder here to, um, to have that optimistic perspective that Michael presented, in particular because all the um, sort of scenarios of uh, expansion of wind, et cetera, uh, rely on balancing across the country from Delaware to Arizona, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, a critical infrastructural problem is the grids. And you need tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars to actually improve <coughs> the grids in this country. I was wondering whether that kind of counting is happening in your new energy finance uh, type uh, numbers, or if you see that as a, as a critical obstacle to growth, or you know, if you could comment on the US picture that would be better. Right. Thank you. Okay. We're going to take this question right over here. Hi. My name is Anupam Khanna. I'm visiting from Delhi, where I work for advise the government on transport and energy. Uh, but I'm speaking per, in a purely personal capacity. I think the presentations were excellent. But let me give you a perspective of the new ge geopolitics from uh, the view from Delhi. Because okay. we've been looking also at Delhi, China, and South Africa. We're going to need to make it quick, though, yeah. so we can get there. Okay. I think the point that I wanted to make is, you, you, at the very end, you have actually touched on where I think the new geop geopolitics is actually hitting the world today, which has to do with transport, and not just transport in terms of electric vehicles. I think there's a much bigger issue. India is going to be spending a trillion dollars over the next 
five years on infrastructure, half on energy, and half on transport. Now, one of the big issues that arises in transport is what do we do? What do we spend it on? And this thing is, we have a 20 year horizon. And I think a number of geopolitics, I don't have time to do it. Let me give you one other one, which was actually covered in the FT two, two weeks ago. It's not just energy for transport, but transport for energy. Look at what is happening to the coal market. India is now importing 100 million tons. China is importing a multiple of that. And that has changed the geopolitics of energy. South Africa, there's a big controversy in the political controversy because ESCOM is feeling short change because of the export to India. Okay. Similarly in Indonesia. I, I don't have much more time, but for example, solar energy in India, huge amount being invested, but it's not clear that the uh, policy action is correct. And the policy action becomes related to the, uh, you know, the politics. Actually, I think one needs to separate out the investment action, which is possibly in energy, which you all are focused on. But really, the policy and the geopolitics action actually has to do much more with transport and movement of energy. Great, thank you. OK, so the first question is on the US and sort of the grid transmission infrastructure no. issues. And the second one, a little bit on which is actually an excellent point, something that I think Doug was alluding to before. Is, you know, geopolitics of energy is about who has energy and who needs it and what it takes to get it there. And so in a lot of ways, some of these new energy sources change that dynamic a bit. But Michael, did you want to start on the US picture? Or either? Sure. sure. So um, in those numbers, we would only consider, in terms of just tracking money flowing, we would put it in if it was an extension to the grid that was needed specifically to wire up a wind farm. If it's just generic grid improvement, uh, then it's not in there. If it's um, wind related, it is. If it's smart grid, it's in there. Okay. Now you can imagine the trouble we have, you know, getting our analysts to sort of, you know, to, uh, judging whether something's in or out. Um, so that's technically what we've got in those figures. Your point is absolutely uh, spot on. That the grid is. Uh, at the heart of this, and improving the grid is at the heart of this. Um, not only because clean energy is not in the locations that people expected things to be when they built the existing grid, um, but also because you've got to build in that intelligence. It's got to be smart enough you know, that you've got to be able to do demand shifting, voltage regulation, uh, fault finding, all those sorts of things. The interesting thing is, of course, those things too become cheaper and cheaper. And so if you look at how do you deal with intermittency, the kind of, the, the word on the street is, oh, well, you need backup power. So every wind farm, you need a gas, fire, uh, you know, gas peaker. That's the most expensive and dumbest way to do it. Um, what you can also do is, of course, but the cheapest way is shift demand. Just turn people's freezers down for five minutes, and they don't even notice it, and those sorts of things. Um, and then there's, of course, you, you can also link grids to other countries. I mean, what will, what will certainly happen, and by the way, in Germany, what they'll probably do is r end up ringed by other nuclear power stations <laughs> in France and Bulgaria and, and so on. But they won't have any, so they'll feel very uh, safe. Um, but but, but linking, you know, linking grids um, across, whether it's across continental divides, and so on, of course, there's going to be you know, a massive amount of that sort of investment in the next 20, 30 years. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, of course, you can also, uh, you've got to talk about power storage in order to deal with the intermittency issues. And storage too, surprise, surprise, is going down on its experience curve. Uh, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. We saw the curve for vehicle storage, lithium ion, but you've got sulfur chemistries and you've got pumped storage and so on. So the answer is all of those things are, are, are needed. Um, of course they're difficult because you know, everything's difficult. What's not difficult? You know, and, but I think what we're talking about here, what I'm talking about on, on, uh, is the sort of 10, 20 years, we're going to be in a different environment. That's kind of how I've interpreted the, you know, the, the challenge around geopolitics is sort of you're making decisions now that, that can either get you into a more difficult or a, or a less difficult place uh, in some decadal time frame. Uh, none of these technologies are ready to deploy right now uh, at such scale uh, that they can change um, the game. I had a journalist once called me and, it, uh, and said, I'm on deadline, I need to know five technologies in the automotive space that will change geopolitics. Um, <laughs> and it will change geopolitics in the next five years. And I said, I said, when's your deadline? He said, oh, I've got about 20 minutes. And I said, OK, well, in that case, smaller cars, um, what else can you do? You can do public transport. Um, you, can, you sort of run out of options for the quick stuff very, very quickly, very, very early. 
Um, to come back to the point made by the, the, the gentleman in, in India, I think it's, you know, first of all, I think that that's exactly, those are the sorts of issues I was trying to refer to when I talked about the fact that this is going to influence trade flows, money flows, uh, all of those sorts of capital formation, you know, whether India spends money on importing coal or whether it spends it on its own solar or whether it spends it on somebody else's solar. And again, it's the same issue. You're making decisions now that probably not going to provide solutions in the very short term but you have to use a sort of balanced scorecard approach and say, well, this decision helps me in my relations with China, uh, helps me sort out my um, environment in the city, my, my air quality in the cities, but makes me dependent on Bolivian lithium or, or whatever. And you've just got to go through those sorts of scorecards. And I'll tell you, nothing is going to be easy. Everything, there is a downside. Well, that's one thing about energy. I'm sure you've spotted this as well. <laughs> there is no decision where you can simply do the balance sheet and say, do you know what? No incumbent gets harmed. There are no environmental problems. It doesn't drive the price up, et cetera, et cetera. So good luck. But, uh, but, you know, it but is that cheap. Is, that, and it's cheap. And it's cheap. So, so, so that is the challenge. And, and, and that's the challenge for all of us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just offer a quick comment on the, on the US infrastructure piece, which is, um, uh, the, the National Renewable Energy Lab and many other um, organizations have looked at um, alternative electricity scenarios. I won't talk more broadly about other pieces, but this might include a, a fair amount of electrification of the of the uh, of the vehicle fleet, uh, uh, either a clean energy standard, a large federal uh, level uh, attainment of renewable portfolio standards, climate scenarios, etc. The transmission infrastructure issues that that you talk about. Um, are real, but they're not, um, they're not the, a necessary red flag from a financial standpoint. They're, they're a challenge, more importantly, from a regulatory permitting and building standpoint because of the jurisdictional issues in the US. But some scenarios really point to, you know, and again, over an evolution of, let's say, 30 or 40 years, one, you have with retirement of existing facilities, you have the ability to put new generation on and use the existing facilities. You've got quality upgrades, and then you've got new builds and, and you know, restructuring of uh, you know, uh, balancing authorities like have been, been looked at in the Western and the Eastern interconnects. They show new investments uh, less than 5%, uh, less than 10% uh, at maximum of the overall investment in the energy system going forward. So it's not a major portion of that investment portfolio, but it certainly is something that's absolutely required and given the time frames, needs to be addressed. Mm. Claude, did you have any? Well, I think we, it's about, we've reached uh, the end of our program, but I just wanted to thank our speakers today, Michael, Claude, and, uh, and Doug, and especially Doug for all the support that he lent for putting the program together. And also our team here, uh, Lee and Molly, uh, uh, for putting all the, the work together. And we'll be continuing this uh, work on the geopolitics of energy. But thank you all very much. And please uh, join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you,